She works in the afternoon only because we usually go on Monday or Tuesday afternoon. So. <laughs> Everyone's kind of coming in right now. So. Good morning, church. We're going to uh, get started with a song, so let's stand and uh, call ourselves to worship.
take a seat. Thank you, worship team. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We're so glad you are here this morning. I'm very thankful you're here. Uh, welcome to BFC. My name is Tony with a couple things to share with you. Uh, first of all, when you walked in, you may have noticed a strange new wall in this school. Um, so to explain that, I've asked a couple people to uh, please come forward and tell us what that wall is about. Right away. Maybe start with uh, your names. Uh, my name is Chloe. My name is Annika. Okay, and then why are you up here? Um, because I was told to. <laughs> <laughs> um, this summer, in the end of July, we are going on a missions trip to Ensenada, Mexico. So the wall out front is um, different envelopes with prices on them or like numbers on them. So there's 144 envelopes, and if each envelope gets taken off the wall and donated, we can raise up to uh, $10,440. Okay. And then um, each like envelope, when you take it, it has a card of like one of our faces inside, and they're prayer cards. So they'll like tell us a little bit about who's going on the trip and whoever you get, and then it'll have a picture of us, and you can just put it on your fridge or something, and it's just to remind her to be praying for us in our, like, mission. So specifically, like, what are you excited about, and then what are you hoping to have prayers about? Like, what, what prayers are you hoping for? I'm most excited for the relationships we're going to make there. I'm just so excited to impact people there and just learn about their culture. And you could be praying for our plane ride there because planes are really scary and you could also be praying that we find just make an impact on the people God wants us to <laughs> oh um yeah just prayers for uh safe travels there and safety like getting across the border and just that will impact others and that we can get enough money raised for all of us to get on the trip or go on the trip and then um, just for like a smooth building of the houses that we're going to be building. When is the trip? End of July. How long do they have to grab a thing off the wall? How long is the wall up until it's gone? Four weeks? Four weeks. Four weeks. I knew that. Or just grab the wall down. And then we just take the wall down. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Perfect. Uh, with a couple men's opportunities, so the, the training table is what we call our men's Bible study. Um, Brian Smart has worked out a nice, this beautiful packet here. Uh, if you've done this before, then you know, know what the plan is. We're going to start doing our homework or assigned readings this week with the intent of meeting next week. So the, the, the planned Bible studies will be meeting next week. If this is something you need information on or if you need help signing up, uh, feel free to contact me. Uh, my name is Tony. I'm on stage. I will be out back after church. Um, another opportunity we have as men to serve and serve each other, uh, if you were at the breakfast, we had an assignment to, to serve each other in the church and then take a picture. And since I haven't seen any pictures yet, I'm assuming we're still in the planning stage. So find someone in the church you could help. Find another, another man you could do an activity with. Snap a picture, send it to me. Uh, my number's in the directory. Um, we have another... Very exciting opportunity, Jake, if you'd raise your hand. Jake's tall. He likes to sit in the middle. It's perfect. Uh, he will be straight out back at the green table. Um, and please talk to him after service about that exciting opportunity we have to serve coming up in May. That is what I want to give you today. Let's pray for this worship service. Almighty Father, it is good to be here today. It is a glorious day, and you are a glorious king. We are so thankful that you are totally worthy to be worshipped and glorified. So please, Lord, uh, enter this service. Uh, make your name great. Make your oneness between us uh, be you. And uh, we ask this in your son's name. Amen.
strength, my song in the night. Be my all, my treasure, my prize. I am yours forever, you're mine. Draw me close and teach me to
your neighbor, get to know somebody new. I hate to interrupt all of the connection and greeting, but if you would, uh, maybe find your way back to your seat and open up your Bibles, and please turn to the book of Matthew. I know you all just finished uh, a series on the Sermon on the Mount a little bit ago, and so we're going to be diving into the beginning of the book of Matthew again, but not in the Sermon on the Mount, but a passage just... uh, few verses before the Sermon on the Mount. So Matthew chapter 3, we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 17. This is Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. Hear the Word of God. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John, to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, The heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Please pray with me. O Father in heaven, help us now to understand your word, to see you more clearly. Would your spirit descend on us, perhaps not in the form of a dove like it does in Jesus in this passage, but would you help us by your spirit to see you more clearly, to understand your love more, and to be moved and transformed by it. Be with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. If someone asks you to tell them what God's love is like, what would you say? What what is God's love? What would you say it's like? Our culture sentimentalizes and distorts the love of God in all kinds of different ways. For example, maybe you've heard some of these uh, slogans before. God loves everybody just as they are, meaning he doesn't care about sin or require repentance, which is just cheap grace. Or maybe you've heard the slogan, love is love, referring to the kind of modern sexual revolution, which is just perversion. Or maybe you've heard the kind of phrase, love wins, love wins, meaning that God's love is so powerful that everyone will ultimately be saved regardless of what they do or believe, and that's just universalism. Or maybe you've heard God is love, 
which of course is scriptural, that's in the Bible, but it's often twisted to mean love, however I want to define it, is God. And that's just idolatry. However, even if we set all those cultural uh, distortions of God's love aside, and we want to be more biblical, and we're answering this person's question, what, what is the love of God? I think we're still often accustomed to thinking of God's love only in terms of his love for us. Maybe your mind goes to John 3.16, and you think about what God's love does. It moves him to send his son into the world to die for us so that we might have everlasting life. Or you might think of Romans 5, which says that God's love is displayed in the death of his son Jesus while we were still sinners. And both of those things, and many others, are gloriously true, of course. But our default thoughts still tend to be, when it comes to God's love, largely revolving around us and God's love for us. However, I think there's something more central and foundational to the love of God than his love for us. And I think we see it in this passage this morning. What is it? It's that first and foremost, the love of God is God's love for himself. God infinitely, eternally, and omnipotently loves himself and his own glory. And this infinite self-love is the great wellspring, the source of everything else, all his other loving acts of creation and providence and redemption, including his love for us. And so my desire this morning is really kind of simple. My desire is that in Matthew 3, in this little passage, verses 13 through 17, we would see the love of God for God, and that by seeing it, we would be changed by it. And of course, we want to understand the passage on its own terms before we get there, and so our roadmap this morning is pretty simple. It's just first, I want to walk through and explain the text. There's a number of interesting little points here. Uh, What does fulfill all righteousness mean and things like that? We want to understand the text in its own context, on its own terms. So this isn't just, you know, using this text to jump off and talk to something else, talk about something else. We want to understand this text. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to walk through the text first. And then I want to pick one jewel out of the text and almost like a jeweler, lift it up for all of us and just turn it around and look at the many facets of God's love. I want to meditate on God's love in this passage. So two parts. We're going to walk through the text, and we're going to meditate on God's love this morning. But before getting into the specifics of this text, it's important to understand a paragraph like this in its context. We're just kind of dropping down into this book. We haven't been walking up to it uh, in, in context. So what's going on in the book of Matthew up to this point? In the beginning of Matthew chapter 1, Matthew introduces his subject, This is the book of Jesus Christ, the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David. And so uh, Matthew situates Jesus in the grand story of the Bible up to this point. Jesus is the long-awaited seed of Abraham through whom the nations will be blessed. And Jesus is the royal son of David, the long-awaited king who will establish God's kingdom on earth. That's kind of chapter one, that that great big genealogy at the front. Chapters, uh, the end of chapter 1, the beginning of chapter 2 then, tells us how Jesus' birth and childhood fulfill. He's born of a virgin in 1.23. He's born in Bethlehem in 2.6. He escapes from Egypt in 2.15. And then chapter 3, kind of, if you're thinking about it as a movie, chapter 3 kind of fast forwards through Jesus' life up to the very brink of Jesus' ministry. He's an adult now. He's about to start his public ministry. And this is kind of uh, preceded or the, 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 uh, the road is set before him by the preaching of his cousin, John the Baptist, who proclaims the imminence, the nearness of God's kingdom and of the coming king, and therefore the urgent need for God's people to repent, to confess their sins and to repent. That's John's ministry up to this point. And so, our little paragraph here, verses 13 through 17, is kind of part of the preparation for Jesus' public ministry to save sinners 
that's going to be expounded in the rest of the Gospel of Matthew. So that's the context here. So look with me again at verse 13 as we start to actually walk through this text now. Matthew writes, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. So the action begins by Jesus coming to John from Galilee in order to be baptized by him in the Jordan River. Now, this should immediately strike us as weird. This should immediately strike us as odd. What on earth is going on here? Why? Because just two verses earlier, in verse 11, uh, Matthew gives us three reasons. First, it says John was baptizing people for repentance. That is, he was baptizing people, he was baptizing sinners who had confessed their sins and repented at his preaching and now bore fruit in keeping with repentance. But Jesus is no sinner. Jesus has no sin to confess. He has nothing to repent of. So what on earth is he doing coming to John to be baptized by him? Second, John the Baptist says in verse 11 that the one whose way he's preparing, namely Jesus, is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. Dealing with someone's dirty, dusty sandals is lowly servant stuff. So what John is saying in verse 11 there is, he's not even worthy to be Jesus' lowest servant. And why is that? Because John himself is a sinner. John knows that Jesus, his cousin, is sinless and that he's a sinner. He's not worthy to baptize the Lord. So what's going on here? And then third, John doesn't say that the one who comes after me will also need to be baptized, but John actually says, he who comes after me will baptize, and not just with water, but with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So Jesus is going to come with a baptism greater than John's. And so putting all these pieces together, John has this picture in his mind of the sinless Lord coming to him, uh, the sinless Lord who comes to baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire, and here Jesus comes to be baptized by a sinner for repentance. What on earth is going on here? Why is, what, what? So when Jesus comes to John, we ought to feel confused and disoriented and amazed, which is exactly how John feels. Look again at verse 14. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Do you, do you feel what John is feeling at this point now? John gets it. He knows Jesus. He's similar to Peter, for example, in John 13, who would have prevented him from washing his feet in the upper room. Uh, do, you, do you remember that Peter says, no, Lord, you shall never wash my feet, not understanding what it was Jesus was up to. But as in the case of Peter there in John, uh, Jesus also, also gently corrects John the Baptist here in verse 15. It says, but Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. So Jesus tells John to permit it, to allow it. Let it happen, John. He seems to acknowledge the validity of John's reaction. Uh, but as surprising as it is, Jesus' plan is good and wise and must be followed. It's as if he was saying, yes, John, your instincts are correct. You are the one who needs me. And yet it is still fitting, it's still appropriate for this to be accomplished by you baptizing me. But this raises maybe the biggest question in this passage, or maybe the second biggest question. What does it mean for Jesus and John to fulfill all righteousness? What does that phrase mean? For Jesus and John to fulfill all righteousness. And how is it fitting for this to be accomplished by John baptizing Jesus. What's the connection there? So righteousness, a biblical term like righteousness, can have different senses depending on the context it's in. And when it occurs in Matthew, it seems to refer mostly to what God expects of someone. Basically, God's will for someone, which because he's righteous is always righteous. Uh, and so I think the best way to understand it is, is the same way here. That is that, it's God's righteous will 
that Jesus be baptized by John. And to fulfill has a wide range of meaning, but I think here it simply means to completely accomplish. So to fulfill all righteousness means to completely do what God expects. It's really kind of a straightforward phrase. But that doesn't yet answer the question why it's fitting for them to fulfill all righteousness in this way. That is, by John baptizing Jesus instead of the other way around. I think that it's fitting or appropriate for John to be the one to baptize Jesus precisely because John's baptism is a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. In fact, exactly what makes John's baptism, what, what makes this whole scene confusing is exactly what makes it fitting. This is because though Jesus was sinless, he nevertheless needed to identify with the sinful humanity that he was going to save. Isaiah 53 predicts that the suffering servant of the Lord would be indistinguishable from the rest of sinful humanity. In verses 2 and 3 of Isaiah 53, he says, He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And he became a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, so that, going on in verse 4, he could bear our griefs and carry our sorrows. In other words, it was God's righteous will for his sinless son to become the suffering servant by identifying with them before winning their salvation. And John's baptism for repentance was exactly how he would do that. And so why baptism? What, what makes baptism the instrument of accomplishing this uh, righteousness? That's because, among other things, baptism is a way of kind of symbolically identifying with someone. We see that in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, where Paul talks about us being baptized into Christ Jesus in his death and resurrection. When we're baptized into Christ Jesus, when we trust in Jesus, we're united to him, and his death and resurrection counts for us. We've died, and we've been risen to life with him through faith. In baptism is a way of kind of identifying, publicly identifying with Jesus in his death and in his resurrection. And so, similarly, what's going on here is that uh, in this passage, and what's so amazing about it is before we ever identified with Jesus and his righteousness, he comes to the Jordan to, to be baptized uh, in order to identify with us in our sin so that he would be fully prepared to be a substitute in our place, to suffer for our sins, and to save us from death and hell. So yes, it indeed was fitting for John to be the one to baptize Jesus and in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Now, as we continue walking through this text, we get to verses 16 and 17. I kind of divide this passage into, into two parts, uh, verses 13 through 15, where this is back and forth between John and Jesus, and then verses 16 and 17, which is an absolute feast. Whenever you see the phrase, and behold, in the Bible, pay attention. Don't miss what comes next. That's the author's way of saying, this is what I want you to see. Don't miss it. And what's amazing is that we have two and beholds back to back. And behold, the heavens were opened to him and the spirit descended on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said. It's hard to miss what Matthew is drawing our attention to. He wants us to not miss the descent of the spirit on the son and the proclamation of the father over the son. In other words, Jesus fulfilling all righteousness prompts this public eruption of Trinitarian love and delight between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So look with me again at verse 16. Matthew writes, And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up out of the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. Two quick questions here. Why the Spirit? What's going on here? I don't think that it's because Jesus did not have the Spirit before this moment. In fact, uh, being God from all eternity, He is 
uh, one, equal with the Spirit from all eternity, and yet he was also conceived of the Holy Spirit in Mary's womb. We see that in chapter 1, verse 18. And so it's not that Jesus didn't have the Spirit before, and now he does have the Spirit here at his baptism, but rather I think this is just a particular affirmation of God's intimate presence with Jesus, preparing him for the ministry he's about to accomplish. And I think this is actually confirmed in the very next passage, Matthew 4, verse 1, chapter 1 of verse 4, uh, sorry, chapter, huh, chapter 4, verse 1, which says that Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, where he is victorious on behalf of his people. And then, this is probably maybe most people's uh, main question when they come to this passage, why the dove? Why does the Holy Spirit take on the form of a dove here? I think we'll understand that better if we keep going. So let me punt that question for just a few minutes. Don't worry, we'll get to it. As we move on to verse 17 now, it's, we see that it's because Jesus completely obeys his Father's will in identifying with the sinners he's about to save that the Father chooses this moment to confirm and more fully reveal the identity of his Son. And the, word God, the words that God chooses to do this are significant. They're rich with Old Testament significance. So, for, for example, in Psalm 2, verse 7, the Lord says to his Messiah, David, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. And so in calling Jesus my son from Psalm 2, in front of all who are present there, he is publicly identifying Jesus as the long-awaited Davidic king and Messiah who will usher in God's eternal heavenly kingdom. But lest we carry that imagery of the, the king, and Psalm 2 goes on to talk about uh, the, this Messiah shattering the nations as with a rod of iron. Unless we carry that too far and expect Jesus to start shattering the nations with a rod of iron, there's also strong connections to Isaiah 42. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1, where God says, this is unbelievable. God says, Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. Doesn't that ring with all of the resonance of what the Father says to Jesus here at the baptism? This is speaking of the same servant as Isaiah 53, who will bring forth justice to the nations by suffering for them. And this is also in part what's behind the whole spirit descending and coming to rest upon him. So not only is this son, not only is Jesus here proclaimed to be the Davidic son, the royal Messiah, but he's also proclaimed to be the suffering servant who will bear the sins of his people. So God is saying a lot, actually, by kind of echoing these Old Testament passages and proclaiming what he does over Jesus. So we've kind of walked through the text now, uh, and here's what I'd say the main point is. If you're, a, if you're a main point, give me the gist. The main point is this. Jesus had to be baptized by John so that he could identify with the sinful people he was about to save. And when he did so, the Father and the Spirit join in publicly affirming and testifying to the identity of the Son. So Jesus had to be baptized by John so that he could identify with the sinners he was about to save. And when he did that, it's like heaven erupts with joy and revealing who this son truly is. And so it's that explosion of Trinitarian joy in verses 16 and 17, which is why I picked this passage to preach on this morning. And it's where I want to spend the rest of our time, actually. The revelation of this affection between the persons of God in verses 16 and 17 is, is that diamond that I want to kind of pull out of this deep mine and, and turn around. I want to consider it from every angle possible so that we can just appreciate who God is and what his love is like. So, look with me again at verse 17. What does the Father say? He says, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Have you ever paused to ask yourself what that means? What does it mean that 
God the Father calls Jesus his beloved son? Or what does it mean that he is well pleased with the son? That's not a trick question. It means the father loves the son. It means that the father takes pleasure in his son. As Isaiah put it, the father's soul delights in him. Verse 17 is the first time that the voice of God himself has thundered from the heavens in over 400 years of silence since the close of the Old Testament canon. God's people had been without a word from the Lord for over 400 years. And what does God say to break the silence? He proclaims his infinite love for and delight in his son. That's no small deal. But it isn't just one way. It's not just a one-way street where the father just loves the son. The son, full of the father's love for him, returns the affection perfectly. Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 31, I do as the father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love God the Father. So Jesus obeys his Father's will in order to display to the world his love for the Father in the similar way that God just displayed to the world his love for the Son. So, and also in, in Proverbs 8, verse 30, there's another kind of picture of shared joy between the Father and Son. Wisdom in that chapter, Proverbs is all about wisdom. Wisdom is personified in that chapter as the Son of God who says, I was daily his delight rejoicing before him always. So the father daily delighted in the son. The son rejoiced always before the father. So here's this mutual delight between the father and the son. And that's in the Old Testament. So that's long before he actually came incarnate. So it's the father, it's the son. Where's the spirit in this? How's the spirit play a role in, in this kind of uh, overflow of love? I think the Holy Spirit is the spirit of perfect love and delight that the Father and Son have in one another. That is, the Father and Son love one another through the Holy Spirit, which is why I think Paul says in Romans 5, verse 5, that God's love is poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And this is also where we actually come back and answer the dove question. Why the dove? If you're familiar with the Song of Solomon which is uh, probably a, a book that all of us don't really know what to do with. It's, a, it's just rejoicing in marital love between King Solomon and his bride. It's a, it's a celebration of, of love as God has designed it. And yet, all through that book, both the lover and the beloved express their love to one another by calling each other, my dove. Your eyes are like doves. Your eyes are full of love. And so, when the father wants to publicly express his infinite love and delight in his worthy son, he pours out his spirit on him in the form of a dove. I think it has to do with the father's love for the son, that the spirit comes upon him in the form of a dove. And what makes all this love even more amazing is that it didn't begin here at Jesus' baptism in the Jordan or even at his incarnation when Jesus condescended to take on flesh, to uh, become like one of us, to redeem us from our sins. No, God's love never had a beginning or it will ever have an end. Jesus says in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, he says that the Father loved him before the foundation of the world. In other words, this, this fellowship of infinite affection and mutual satisfaction, this interplay of infinite love between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is, has, has never had a beginning, and it never will have an end. It's from eternity to eternity. And so behind all these kind of Old Testament references in, in God's words, this baptism scene here at the Jordan reveals that the Father loves the Son and pours out His Spirit of love on Him, showing us that God's love is Trinitarian to the core. Now, pause, step back for a moment. All of that might seem kind of heady and philosophical. Why does any of this matter? Why, did, what, why is it important that God's love is Trinitarian? As I was reflecting on that, 
I came up with eight reasons. These aren't the only eight, but I just want to give them to you. Here are eight reasons why it's important to know that God's love is Trinitarian. One, because God's love is Trinitarian, it is essential. That is, it's intrinsic to who God is. It's one of his attributes that makes him God. If God was not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from all eternity, if God was just a lone, lonely kind of unit, personal God, just one person out in the eternal nothingness by himself before he created anything, then he could not have loved until he created the universe. And so love could not have been essential. It could not have been one of his attributes if he was not triune. And so because God is a trinity, love is intrinsic to who he is as God, which is why John writes in 1 John 4, 8, that God is love. So that's reason number one. Because God's love is Trinitarian, it is essential to who he is as God. And that is good. Reason number two. Because God's love is Trinitarian, it is deep. It is unfathomable. I'm kind of using uh, love and delight here interchangeably because we see God proclaim his love for the Son and his complete delight in the Son. They're, they're bound up together. And so how much pleasure, how much delight do you think an infinite God can experience? How much delight can an infinite God experience? infinite. It's unending. You can't get to the bottom of it. And so when the father says that he is well pleased with his son, he is saying that his infinite capacity to experience pleasure is perfectly satisfied in his son. In other words, God's love and delight, just the the infinite capacity that he has overflows onto the son. In other words, you'll never find the bottom of God's love. It is fathomless. It is unfathomable. And that's because he is a trinity. That's because he is a father who loves his son through the infinite spirit. That is beautiful and amazing. Reason three, because God's love is Trinitarian, it is long. That is, it is unending. It's eternal. As we've already seen, God's love never had a beginning and it will never have an end because it's always existed between the Father and the Son through the Spirit before the world began. It stretches from eternity past through the present to eternity future. And so God's love will never end because it is Trinitarian to the core. Reason number four, because God's love is Trinitarian, it's why. That is, it's expansive. God's love, because it inherently involves three persons in perfect fellowship with one another, it's expansive. It doesn't just all reside on one of the persons of God. It it includes all of them equally. And so it moves outward to include more in its embrace. It overflows itself like a fountain whose very nature is to overflow and increase, to bring many more into its experience. And so if you're a Christian this morning, it's because God's own love has swept you up into itself has filled you up, and now you're overflowing and wanting to show that to as many other people as possible. God's love is expansive. It's wide because he's a trinity. Fifth, fifth reason, because God's love is Trinitarian, it's high. That is, it's aimed upward. And what I mean by that is it's aimed at God. It's God-centered. If the Father is God, and he is, And if the Son is God, and He is, and here in this passage we see the Father loving the Son infinitely, then the object of the Father's infinite love is God. God loves God from all eternity. Now, this is probably the most explosive truth in in this passage, but it's also probably the one that is the most strange or disorienting for us, perhaps even offensive to us. There's something wrong with someone who loves themselves too much, isn't there? We call that person self-centered or egotistical or narcissistic or something like that. So why does, 
why does God escape that charge when he loves himself infinitely? I think that's because that objection is because it assumes a unipersonal God, God who's only one person. But as we just saw, the God-centeredness of God's love is actually Trinitarian. That is because God is inherently interpersonal, his love is also inherently interpersonal. It's not narcissistic. Instead, it's the infinite joy and delight that the Father takes in the Son, and the Son takes in the Father, and the joyful fellowship they all have in the Spirit. And maybe another reason that this God-centeredness of God's love might offend us is because it offends our sense of self-worth. Because when it comes to us kind of finite creatures, the more concerned someone is for themselves, the less concerned he can be for other people, right? And so the more, uh, the, the more God loves himself, the less he, ha- he can love us, right? Like, does God love us at all? No. Uh, well, yes, he does. No, that objection doesn't stand. Uh, God's love for himself and his love for everything else are not at odds with one another but rather his love for himself is the sure foundation for his love for everything else. It guarantees his love for everything else, including us. More on that in a moment. The last three observations I have, I said I had eight observations. The last three I have kind of build off of this God-centeredness of God's love. So number six, because God's love is God-centered, it is not idolatrous. Have you ever paused and asked yourself, is it possible for God to commit idolatry? Idolatry is loving anything above or more than or out of right relation to God. And so if God were to love us more than or before or out of right relation to how he loved himself, God would be committing idolatry. But of all beings, God cannot commit idolatry. As Paul says all over the place, may it never be. Therefore, he loves himself supremely and everything else in right relation to himself. And it's because God's love is supremely God-centered that his love for us is not idolatrous, but it's actually rightly ordered. And that is actually good news for us, because if God was an idolater, we could have no hope in anything. Number seven, because God's love is God-centered, it is truly gracious. Since God is eternally satisfied in his own love for himself, he has no deficiency or lack in himself. He has no need for us. We have no rightful claim on God. He's not obligated to us in any way. We cannot say, God, you owe us your love. And yet, he still lavishes it on us. Why? In other words, if God's love is not based on any obligation to us, then it must have another foundation. And I think that foundation is his eternal and omnipotent love for himself. Therefore, it's actually free. It's actually gracious. It's not, it's not tied to us. And then lastly, number eight, this is kind of building off of that or, or, or uh, inference from that last one. Because God's love is God-centered, it is immovable. It's not going to go anywhere. Since God is totally satisfied in himself, and therefore, since his love is totally gracious, it's totally free, it is not given to us based on anything in us. And if we do not get God's love based on anything in us, we cannot lose his love based on anything in us. And that is good news, because if God's love was based on us, we're fickle, we're sinful, don't we? We, we always sin. We could never perform well enough to maintain God's good favor. But because God's love for us is based not on us, but on his own perfect love for himself and satisfaction in himself in the Trinity, we can never lose it by sinning or lose it by anything. That's what makes Paul's point in Romans 8 stand. That's why he says, neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor anything present, nor anything to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, that verse is gloriously true because God's love is God-centered. Now, after all this, you may be wondering to yourself, then why does God love 
did, well, really, does God love me at all? If he really loves himself, does he love me at all? And I think I would say emphatically, yes, he does. In fact, I would say that the only way he can actually love you is because he loves himself supremely. It's the overflow of his expansive love for himself that enables him to love us perfectly, omnipotently, eternally, unmovably, the way he does. And so in conclusion, my prayer this morning is that like those who are present at Jesus' baptism in Matthew 3, as we come with Jesus to the Jordan this morning, that we saw more than we expected. My prayer is that we got a new glimpse, a fresh glimpse of God's love. This is the bedrock, bedrock, the foundation of all God's loving acts in creation, providence, redemption, and consummation. God's love does not get any deeper than his intra-Trinitarian love for himself. So yes, rest your weary souls, brothers and sisters, on God's love for you, knowing that his love for you is grounded on the sure foundation of his unfathomable, unending, expansive, and immovable Trinitarian love for himself. So let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, thank you for these beautiful words. Thank you for showing the world the identity of your son Jesus when he came to John to be baptized all those years ago. Thank you for proclaiming your love and delight in him and showing us just a little glimpse into who you are as God. Would you transform us? Would you establish our faith on that sure foundation? Your love is never going to go anywhere because of who you are as God and how you Love yourself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Oh, bless us as we go about our week this week. Would we trust in you and would we experience more of that, uh, more of your love in yourself, in us? It's in your Son's beautiful name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Um, in case you didn't know, uh, we've been candidating with Stephen and his family this weekend. Specifically, we've been uh, talking to him for a couple months. Um, got to spend some time in fellowship yesterday and a little bit this day. So if you get a chance and you'd love to meet him, uh, please take the time today to go talk to him. We are uh, we're having a, a member's vote in two weeks, so after church on the 28th where we would, uh, we would like to call Stephen to come be our full-time preaching pastor. So it's a very exciting time, very very excited for what God has, has been doing in our church. I'm so thankful for you and your wife for coming up this weekend and, and, and sharing your time. Uh, this is not my jacket. <laughs> it's definitely not my color. Um, it will be up here. It was left behind, and it's really nice out, so you probably wouldn't think you need it, but uh, this was left behind, so I'll leave this up here for anyone. Uh, if you're a guy, go talk to Jake. Uh, if you're new, they'll also be at that, that green table. They'd love to talk to you and help you get connected. I see a few new faces I don't know yet. So we'd love to get to you know you further. There will be uh, elders up front. If you are in need of prayer, we'd love to pray over you as well. Um, I do want to, I did have uh, Psalm 9014. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that, may we, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Rejoice and be glad today. Have a good day.